Chris, it's always great. Good to catch up. Times, times online, rugbypass.com. Our man, Chris Jones. All right. We've got so much to talk about. First and foremost, though, there's going to be a couple of reviews. Wales are going to have one. And the best news of all is that England are going to have one. And the best news about that is they sent out an email saying that there's going to be a review, but they want everyone on the review panel to be anonymous, yet they send out a, a, an, an advisory. So how the hell does that work? So we all, you know who they are, but they're now anonymous, are they? Well, they, they, it sounds like that they only agreed to go on the panel if they could remain anonymous. Now, you'd, you'd expect that if you're actually putting somebody to death in a gas chamber in, a, in an American prison, you wouldn't necessarily want your name out in the public domain. Picking the England rugby coach, I don't think, comes into the same sort of category. But there you are. That's the RFU at the moment. They are making all kinds of strange decisions. We know that in the past when, when, when uh, Eddie's been reviewed, and he's been reviewed after every championship and you could ask the question well if he's he's so bad after the last two six nations how is he still in the job and that is a question that we ask yet again but we know that people like brian ashton the old uh, england coach who took him to the 2007 world cup and ian mcgeek and the lions coach have been used as sounding boards in the past uh whether they'd be involved again who can tell because they're anonymous Chris, Eddie Jones has got a, a, just a rock-solid contract right through to the World Cup next year. Uh, you know, the, 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 re the realistic possibility of them removing him and also where does Scott Robertson fit in this? Because here in New Zealand, what we're thinking is we're thinking that Razor is just floating this out there. Just to remind the New Zealand Rugby Union that if they don't lock him down now, that they're not going to get him. And we know the balls up that New Zealand Rugby did trying to replace Steve Hansen as coach last time. So there's a bit of for you to, to, to mull over in that. Oh, very much. Look, Scott's done a really good job. I mean, it, it, actually, the, the arrivals desk at Heathrow has been full of New Zealand coaches coming, making himself available for jobs all over the United Kingdom at the moment. And we'll get on to Gats in a minute. But, uh, yeah, Ray's has done really well. He's had loads of uh, pats on the back from players who've worked with him with the Barbarians. Yeah, he is on that short list, along with Ronan O'Gara and Steve Borthwick, uh, that England are looking at. That's for post-World Cup 2023, because... You know, they pay uh, Eddie £750,000. And uh, I was uh, part of the uh, the parliamentary investigation into the RFU's handling of Wasps and Worcester's demise in the week. And uh, Bill Sweeney uh, got an absolute kicking from the MPs. Uh, he had to defend himself against all different types of accusations. And he's going to be right at the heart of does Eddie stay or go? And the fact is the guy knows nothing about rugby. All he kept on telling us was that the uh, utilities bills for Twickenham have gone from £2 million to £78 million uh, this year because of the rises in inflation, and therefore they're probably not going to make a profit. Therefore, you can extrapolate that to paying Eddie £750,000 a year and having to pay him off. They haven't got the cash. All right, so that means he stays and he's going to be through to the World Cup. So where does it leave Razor, though? Because, you know, we don't know whether Ian Foster wants the job after the World Cup. What say the All Blacks do win that World Cup? I mean, and, and, he, and he does want to stay. I mean, you know, there's because you've got this tricky employment law situation in New Zealand as well where you can't hire somebody for a job that somebody's actually already in. That's called constructive dismissal. Well, uh, oh, but can you guys afford £750,000 to keep Razor in? New Zealand, because that's obviously the going rate for an England coach. And that's the going rate for an England coach, by the way, who's still allowed to have all his uh, banking and whiskey deals in Japan, to be to be a consultant for San Diego Legion, to, to, you know, to be, a, to, to be a, a consultant for Suntory Rugby in, in Japan as well. So you, it's a good gig to get the, the RFU one, because thanks to what they've allowed Eddie to do, you can earn three quarters of a million pounds and still have probably five or six other contracts, and they won't stand in your way. So, honestly, it's a big gig up here in terms of money. And Razor, I know he want the he'll want the All Black job. But crikey, if he could do a good job with England and then go to the All Blacks with a with a huge wad in his uh, bank account, sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Well, what are you picking though? What do you think is going to happen? I think that he's got a really really good shot at it. It's whether he's prepared to wait for the All Blacks for the next cycle. And probably not. I think we'll probably end up with uh, Ronan O'Gara and Borthwick being at the front runners. And then Eddie will go off to uh, be in charge of the USA rugby for uh, eight years. Well, Dave Rennie's name's been circulated around that as well. I mean, surely that's a place to go and where your career dies, isn't it? They've been bankrupt for a couple of times in the last five years. 
Uh, you know, we keep getting told that the rugby's going to absolutely take over the United States market. I mean, you know, what is it, is it Bill Sweeney saying that? Because it, the bloke that's saying that makes about as much sense, doesn't it? I mean, it's not going to happen. Dave Rennie's future, uh, PVAC's future, it's all up in the air now, isn't it? Is Gats going to be taking over that Welsh shop? Well, it was very, very interesting when the the coverage of the match on on Saturday, uh, pre and post, who's on the touchline, you know, with Michael Checker talking about what went on. But Warren Gatland, he's in Cardiff. He's in the right postcode to be offered the job, and from what we understand, he's very much at the forefront of the discussions of the Welsh review that's going to be going on. And uh, you know, they will be looking really hard about Pivac and saying, can we afford? to have another debacle like the one we witnessed on Saturday, following on from the Italy debacle, following on from the Georgia debacle. Just how many debacles can one coach suffer without being sacked? And you might say, well, hold on, Eddie's doing pretty good. No, but this is a very different thing. Pivak is, is, I would think, is almost certainly going to be given the uh, flying elbow. And initially on the short term, I wouldn't be surprised if Warren isn't brought in to take him to the World Cup. And then he can obviously discuss after that. But yeah, he would get a pretty lucrative gig himself to take Wales, you know, going back to, to, to the country where he's still a god, you know, all the, 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 the six, the winning four Six Nations title, you know, getting to the two World Cup semifinals. The guy's got a fantastic record in Wales. He is he is a god in, in the principality. And it'd be, don't you think he would love it, wouldn't he? The man who's going to save Wales going into the World Cup. He'd love that. Chris Jones, Times, Times Online, RugbyPass.com. Let's look at the results then. Ireland won them all over the Autumn Internationals. France won them all. England lost to Argentina. Uh, they beat Japan. Um, they drew with us. They got thrashed by South Africa. We won three. We drew against England. They capitulated last 10 minutes. South Africa lost to Ireland narrowly, lost to France narrowly, beat Italy, and then absolutely thump England. So those are the five teams that I think most of us are thinking have got a chance of winning the World Cup. Anyone outside that five? Uh, besides Georgia, no. Uh, ah. look, 13 wins, 13 losses for the rugby championship teams against the Northern Hemisphere teams and one draw. It's really tight, isn't it, between the two hemispheres now? And that's all thanks to Ireland and France. Now, I was really impressed with what South Africa did against England. I thought that the way that they're set up now, where, for example, their brilliant try uh, from, from an awful England kick was was them going for it. And they're going for it off Willie LaRue. He's become really important in terms of triggering this attack. And they've got this identical guy on that you don't even need Ches and Kobe. They've got another guy who's just as quick with just as good footwork, who's who's tiny. But when you've got a pack like the South African pack played on Saturday, you can carry small guys out wide because you want them to use that speed. And uh, Khaleesi spoke afterwards about finding a lot of problems this year. And you've seen a lot of their problems in the matches where they've lost. They found some solutions. I was sent a message today by a former England coach who said to me, problem with England, too many problems, not enough solutions. And that's, you know, that's, that's how, how one of the guys who used to be involved with them is looking at it now. He's looking at that squad and seeing an awful lot of problems, which the South Africans have found answers to their problems to a great extent, as long as they keep Rassi up, uh, shut up. Then they're going to be in a, a really strong position, I think, going into the World Cup, because I now see in certain areas they've got some real depth. And yeah, you know, and that's good to see because you know, you want a strong South Africa to World Cup. You want a strong strong New Zealand, and I goodness knows what you're going to get from Australia. Their third team has just beaten Wales, so they've got to have some strength and depth. <sighs> good Lord, so much to process, isn't it? How much does home advantage count? Um, how much of, do any of these results count when it comes to next year's World Cup? Look, you, there's no doubting that that Ireland are fantastically uh, adept at winning the way they want to play at the moment. And it's going to take a very, very good team to stop them in France because in Northern Hemisphere conditions, they're going to be happy, very happy. France, good strength and depth. They're going to have to come down to the thing that has always hampered them before, which is the weight of expectation. And they've shown this year that they can probably handle that. You know, to dog out that win against South Africa was important when they're getting battered. They are, they, they are the real deal. I was impressed with the way that for 70 minutes New Zealand played a Twickenham in a, in a style I thought was a tactically very clever way of playing, which shows you that you start to get some of the sort of the, the aspects that Wayne Smith always brought to the game, which is a real tactical nous and understanding of how to unpick an opposition. And that happened for 70 minutes. 
Uh, and South Africa, I thought, were well worth a, a, probably a bit a slightly bigger win against England. So you've got those sort of four teams, I would say, looking pretty good going into 2023. Goodness knows what the state of play is going to be with Australia and England. And Wales just seems to be a basket case unless the Messiah, Warren, takes over. In your place, your part of the world, Chris, um, the All Black seniors, I'm going to give you a list here. You can choose one. Past it, not good enough. Dangerous in the equation. Not quite the All Blacks of old. Potentially really good. A semi-final place at best. A semi-final place at least. Something in there? Is there one to choose? Yeah, dangerous and in the equation. There's no way you can write uh, New Zealand off at the moment because there are signs that you know that if you can get 14 other people who play like Ardi Sever, you're going to be absolutely fantastic by the World Cup. Unfortunately, parts of that team looked a little bit tired at the end of this tour, which is understandable. You really need to look after Ardi, and uh, you know you're starting to put a back row together, which could be really important for you. And uh, yeah, it needs New Zealand to come firing straight into that World Cup because that opening game is going to set the tone for what could be the best World Cup we've seen because. You really can't pick a winner at the moment, can you? You can pick favourites and guys who, and teams that are going to be in the equation, but you can't pick a number one team that's going to win it from now, and that's great. It's a great position to be in. Finally, is it going to be about the referees and the interpretation of the law? I wrote a couple of things down when I was watching England South Africa yesterday. Um, the referee, you're far too far away from each other. Um, tight head uh, overextending straight in and down for me and I was thinking okay maybe those of us who watch rugby can probably understand that but for any neutral watching and when the tight head's overextending straight in and down for me I mean is that is that going to attract people to watch the sport and also the different interpretations and I asked um, Andy Capistano about this as well uh, the the idea that the referees have to be spread all around the global the global um, you know it's it's all about equity these days and equality and inclusivity and you've got to have a referee from every single part of the planet as well as opposed to being the best referees. How much is this going to be brought to bear on the World Cup and cause chaos? Well, I can tell you what there was something incredibly sad and worrying on Saturday, which was that the RFU had planned to mark Wayne Barnes's 100 uh, tests uh, that he managed. Uh, with a, with a half-time salute. He was going to take to the pitch and be saluted. But because of what Rassi had put into the mix, the death threats that Wayne Barnes's family had received, the appalling online abuse, the RFU at the last minute pulled that uh, celebration of his 100 uh, tests, which is an incredibly sad uh, thing for rugby and something we should all be worried about. Because if that's happening uh, on a worldwide scale and referees, and, we, and we've spoken about this before, are starting to get more and more abuse then, yes, it is going to become harder to referee a match because players will have a certain attitude to them, which has been instilled in them by their directors of rugby, who have been showing them uh, dodgy uh, videos which they can cut whichever way they want. And you end up with a guy in the middle being put under such intense pressure. That you're almost asking, you know, why would they continue doing it if they're going to get death threats and, and vile abuse? Yeah, there was a, it did get uh, ridiculous on Saturday at, at Twickenham. Because I heard Ox on the ref link saying, ref, are you going to continue to change your cadence? Now, if you don't understand what he's talking about, you go, what is he on about? What What? What do you mean his cadence? What's his cadence? And of course, he's just saying that the referee kept on changing the call to engage. He was delaying it longer and longer. And then he wanted a gap on the bind, which I hadn't heard before. So this is this is just a problem which is not going to go away. This was an Australian referee trying to sort out England versus South Africa, which should be and always should be a fantastic fight up front. But he was trying to control it with the most technical of reasons and the most technical of requests that even the South African loose head prop was completely confused about. And if he's confused about it, what the hell are they going to make it in the, in the crowd? They won't know what's going on.